Good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon to those who are around the world. Uh, my name is Willie Gaines, and I'm the Director of Admissions and Enrollment here at Grace School of Theology. And I have the distinct privilege and honor of kicking things off for our September 2020 chapel service, originating here from World Headquarters. We are really, really excited to uh, get reinitiated, to get restarted with our chapel offerings and so forth. And uh, we've been getting great feedback, and we love presenting this information to those of you who are listening around the world. Um, thank you once again for coming in. As a way of getting started today, what I would like to do is uh, do a short scripture reading. Uh, by no means am I going to take away from our featured uh, speaker today, but in lieu of singing to you guys, I think it would be better if I do some, some reading. And uh, those who are here are in hearty agreement with me on that. Um, I just want to talk a little bit, uh, a couple of verses from the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 6. And I'm starting at verse 1, and I'm going to commit a little bit of uh, theological malpractice because I'm not going to read the entirety, but about three verses. And in this time that I find ourselves in, I think this is a really, really appropriate. So if I'm in chapter 6, verse 1, the backdrop to this is that the Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Galatia, and they have been misled or dissuaded by the inputs of others coming in and giving some errant teaching or different opinions and so forth. And so it's really kind of consistent with our times today, not only here in the U.S., but around the world. And it's just getting back to the basics. And so in verse 1, Paul says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So now go down to verse 13 and it will pick up. He says, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I'll stop right there. This transcends race, creed, age, socioeconomic background, or what have you. Just love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we practice that here at Great School of Theology. We are promoting that around the world. And you'll get a chance to witness that with our uh, key speaker today. He's a very, very good friend of mine. I can lead off and say that. He has become a very, very good friend of mine. I actually met him in class here at Grace School of Theology. Just sat back and watched and listened to him quietly at first. But then when he started speaking, he had substance to him. So not a person that is just intellectually astute, but he's experienced some of the things that he's talking about. He has a tremendous ministry that is based here in Houston, Texas, and he's doing a number of things that are really impacting his local community. And I think it's uh, even further that, than that, uh, going statewide and nationwide even, uh, with the way of influence. Again, he is a pastor, uh, he is a graduate of Great School of Theology, and he's continuing his education here as well. So with his accomplishments already, he is continually building on his uh, foundation. And so, guys, it is my pleasure to bring to you uh, our keynote speaker today, Pastor David Hill. Take it away. Amen, David. amen. All right. Can you hear me? I'm good. Great, great. Well, are we good? Can you hear me? Well, I want to say uh, how honored I am, how honored I am to be able to share and speak today. Uh, Grace is very important to me and has been very influential um, in my life. Uh, and so I am thankful for all that, uh, all that they've done for me and with me, and I'm grateful and honored to be able to be here with you today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to tell you where we're going to be. We'll be in Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21 this morning. 
uh, that is where we will be speaking out of today. Uh, but I want to take a moment and just kind of talk to you before we get there about what God has kind of put on my heart this morning and, and how I want to share that with you. You know, I want to talk this morning about purpose and passion in the life of the believer. Purpose and passion in the life of the believer. And I want to talk about it as we look at the life of Paul in Romans. But I want to start by saying this, you know, I, like probably some of you, was a high school athlete, uh, played football and basketball. But, you know, I also realized after a certain point of time, I was unable, as much as I love both of those sports and as passionate as I was about both of those sports, there came a point in time when I could no longer fulfill all that I wanted to be in that sport because I either was unskilled enough, I was not talented enough, I didn't grow big enough, I wasn't fast enough, I wasn't strong enough, but there came a point when I could no longer pursue that and become and experience that sport in its fullness. And so like a lot of you and like a lot of people, I now I have teams that I root for, I have certain athletes that I follow and I've been blessed to even have children who are athletes, who've been able to go further than me, and I've been able to find my joy in following them and, 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 and being satisfied through their efforts. And, you know, unfortunately, when we look at the life of believers, that is how a lot of us live. We live our lives knowing Christ, but not fully functioning in the highest levels of the passion and the purpose that he's called us to. And the thing is, unlike athletics in the kingdom, you're not limited by your skill. You're not limited by your natural and fleshly ability. Every believer has the purpose, has the ability to pursue, to pursue their purpose and passion to its fullest. But the, the, the real issue is so many of us find ourselves living vir virtually, if you will, or trying to live through others, what God has intended for us to experience. And so as we look at that this morning, I wanna look in these passages in Romans. If you would permit me, let's read that together. And then I wanna look at the life of Paul and how he was able to pursue and walk in his purpose and passion and how that impacted his life and how God wants to impact your life. Let me read that. I'm going to be reading from the NASB. It says, And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest of the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in these things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and around about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. So I want to talk first, the first thing Paul addresses here, when we talk about purpose and passion, he's writing this letter to the believers in Rome whom he has never met, but he holds them in high esteem because he points out two characteristics right away. He says they are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge. Filled, full of goodness and filled with all knowledge. What does that mean, full of goodness? 
Paul is saying to them, first of all, it is clear that you are out to please God. Your hearts have been transformed. You are serious about this thing and, and you want to please God. And then he says, you are full, filled with all knowledge. You are studying God's word. You are, he's the foundation of all that you are trying to do. You have an understanding of scripture. And he says, and he also says that you are able to correct one another. You are able to admonish one another. When we talk about purpose and passion, we have to start here. It starts in the life of the believer. If I'm going to be purposeful about and find my passion in Christ, I first have to have a surrendered life and I first have to be out to please him. His desire has to be first and foremost. His will has to be first and foremost. And then I have to be filled with knowledge. Now, now Paul was not saying that they knew everything, that they were perfect in all their ways. But what he was saying is their hearts were right and they were sound in doctrine, sound in scripture so that they were able to admonish and correct one another. Basically, what he said is they were mature. And if you're going to pursue a purpose and a passion, maturity has to be of the process that we're all under. There are so many believers who find themselves, and I talk to them like, Pastor Hill, I don't know what my passion, I don't know what my purpose is. The first question is, are you on a path to maturity? Do you have a surrendered heart? Are you in the scripture? Are you praying? Are you seeking God? Is he guiding you and leading you so that you may become all that you desire to be? But Paul first says to them that these folks are legit. They are serious because they are filled and full. And they are able to be, they are mature and able to help and correct one another. And we all as believers have a responsibility to mature and help those along the way. Part, a, lot of, a lot of times we don't see the direction, the passion, the purpose that we want because we're sitting around waiting on God and he's sitting around waiting on you. To say, when are you going to mature and when are you going to begin to give and help and serve in the places where I put you? So that I may begin to cultivate in you what I desire to see in your life. And that is a big part of the that's a big part of finding purpose. It doesn't all, it may not all come to us in one single swoop. But I work, so over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with young men in my neighborhood, in my community. And one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do with them is help them find employment. And so one of the things I've had to teach them, and what I've heard from them a lot of times is, well, Pastor. I'm just waiting on the Lord to give me a job. I'm waiting on God to come through with my job. And what I had to teach them was like, I'm glad that you are depending on the Lord. But while you're waiting on him, there are things you can be doing that can help you along this process. You can be active in the process while you are waiting on God to do what he's going to do. You can be talking to managers, filling out applications. Talking to managers, filling out applications. Following up on the things that you following up on the things that you have been doing, so that when God moves, you are able to see Him active, and 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 you are able to be a part of that process. But just sitting around and waiting on Him, it's just that's not the answer. And so even in the life of believers, while we are seeking our purpose and passion, God wants us to be active in the kingdom, serving, growing maturing, playing a role in the work that is happening. And as we do that, God will begin to unfold his purpose and passion for our lives. Let, let me move on. In, in verse 15, he says, but I have written very, very boldly to you on some point so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles Ministering as a priest of the gospel of God, ministering as a priest of the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Here we see Paul has found his passion. 
His passion is to minister unto the Gentiles. He is a priest unto the Gentiles, and that is what God has called him to do. Uh, Larry Crabb in his book, Finding God, says this. The core problem is not that we are too passionate about bad things, but that we are not passionate enough about good things. We are not passionate enough about good things. What has God stirred in you? And what is it that bubbles in you that yearns and you yearn to do the work that God has called you to? When believers find their purpose and their passion like Paul, they can overcome all kinds of hardships with a motivation and determination that only comes from a calling in Christ. What is it that God has stirred in you? And, and back to my original analogy, this is not based on skill or ability uh, or talent always. It is about what, what is it that God has awakened in you that you sometimes it wakes you up at night. Sometimes when you're supposed to be working on this, you, you, are, you always drift back to this because God has stirred something in your life. Paul found that in his work to the Gentiles. He said, man, this is what God has called me to do. This is my, this is my purpose. So in my community, I, I'm in an inner city context. You know, many of you may know the name George Floyd. That is the neighborhood in which I live in. We knew George Floyd and his family, coached his little brother. My wife went to school with him know many of the young men who are associated with that movement have been working in this community for a long time. One of the things that I try to get across to all the young people that come across our path that I have the opportunity to minister to, my goal is always to in, have them engage God enough to find their purpose. Because when you find your purpose, it, you can overcome every obstacle in this world, no matter what it may be. Poverty, injustice, handicaps, disenfranchisement, all of these things that I've seen plague people in my community. I've also seen people overcome when they find their purpose and their passion in Christ. And here's the thing, when you find your purpose and your passion in Christ, those things that were stumbling blocks now become blocks that begin to mature you. They begin to help you understand and you see God over help you overcome things that would have hindered you in the past. But this all begins when we mature, when we are filled full of his goodness, filled with his knowledge. And when we pursue and engage God, Lord, reveal to me why you created me, why you've made me the way you've made me. And what we find oftentimes is you may have struggled in other areas of life, but when you find your purpose and passion in him, I promise you, you will find that you've been created perfectly for that. And it will all make sense. But we've got to engage him enough. And so Paul is telling uh, the believers here in verses uh, 15 and 16 that, man, I have been called to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest of the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, he says, therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. When you find your purpose and your passion, you will find your reason for existence. Existing. Everything becomes about glorifying God. And here's the thing I've learned, and we gotta be careful about this, because when you find your purpose and passion, and God may allow you to have some success in that. And he will begin to use you. And you will begin to see uh, the power of God manifest itself in your life. We must always be reminded, as Paul says in here. He says, I, 
that I, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God that is never about you. It's never about me. Whatever God does through my life, through the passion and the purpose that I have found in him, whether it is great or small in the eyes of man, it is never about me. And this is something we have to be careful about because I'm going to be honest with you here, if you will allow me to, you know, I'm not allergic to having my name in lights. You know, I don't mind people uh, telling David Hill that he's doing a good job. That, that feels good to us all, amen? Everybody likes to have a little praise. But the danger is, I can, it can never become more about me than it is about him, about Jesus. And Paul was saying this in 17. He says, again, that, that I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. So Paul, with his resume, with all that he was doing, this fantastic outreach and evangelistic effort he had at reaching the Gentiles. I mean, if Paul was living in our day, he would be the man. I mean, he was the man in his day. He was getting it done. He would have been the guy that everybody was coming to seminars to read about, to listen to. He would have, if he had written books, he, obviously he wrote these books and we're still reading them. But if he was living in our day, he'd have many books out and people would be traveling all over the world to see him. He'd probably be highly popular. And with those things, sometimes comes this air about us that, man, I found purpose and passion, but look at me. Look what I've done. Paul says, I only find reason to boast in Christ about what is happening. My encouragement to you, no matter where you are, God, you, you, you seek God, you mature in God, you will develop it and you will find your purpose and your passion and God will elevate you. He will use you. And we must never forget that it is not about us, but about him. And in, in verse 18, he says, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. Paul highlights a kingdom focus that we all need as we seek to walk out our call. If we boast in Christ Jesus, not only will our call last, but we will find that Jesus himself does the work through us. Let me share this with you as well. When you, when you seek your purpose and passion and calling, and as God reveals that to you, and as he journeys you in that, you are going to find that it is bigger most times and greater than anything you could do on your own. And Paul is saying here, when we leave all the glory to Christ, we also have the benefit of seeing Christ work through us and do things we could never do in our own strength. And that is part of the glory of it, to see him do a work, to see him use a life that I know was jacked up and messed up from the beginning. You know, when, when God called me and my wife to urban inner city ministry almost 30 years ago, I have to be honest with you and tell you, I was not happy about that. In fact, I was very disappointed. I had plans for my life. I wanted to live the American dream. I had the things that I wanted to do. But God called us uh, to this uh, inner city life and said, David, I want you to raise your family. I want you to be an example to the best of your ability. And I want you to be about the work that I've called you to do here. And one of the things that I began to say to God was, God, I'm not sure you have the right person for the job. This is bigger than what I am able to do. God, not only I'm not seminary trained, I'm not professionally trained to do this. There are other people greater than me who have tried to do this and, and haven't had great success. I'm not sure, God, I can do this. But God required a few simple things. He said, David, all I'm asking you to do is surrender your life to me and allow me to work through you and be faithful. 
That's all I want. Faithfulness from you. Will you do as I ask? And will you surrender your life to me? And I can, and let me tell you something. What God has done in the work has been amazing. How God has used our ministry, our lives, it blows me away over and over again. And even in the midst of knowing uh, how, what God has called me to in this inner city urban context, there are still moments and days, even after seeing all these things, when I have to say, Lord, I'm still not sure you have the right person. The job has gone, it, it's grown, and I'm not sure, God, if, if I can do this. And his message is still the same. David, will you surrender your life, and will you be faithful? Just be faithful to what I've called you to do. My job is to deliver on the results. Your job is to be faithful. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, this morning. Our work, our job in seeking our purpose and passion is to be faithful with a surrendered life. God says, I am the one who changes hearts. I am the one who builds and does the work. I just need faithful and willing hearts. And if you do that, and you always leave room for the glory of God, you will see God do a tremendous work in the call and the purpose and the passion that God wants to do in your life. Let me read verses 20 and 21. He says, or at 19, he says, in the power of signs and wonder, in the power of the spirit, so that from Jerusalem all around about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, that no one, that who had that they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not have not heard shall understand. Paul not only knew what he was called to do, he knew how he was called to do it. Paul says, I'm called to go where others have not been called to go. I'm called to preach as so I am not preaching on another man's foundation. I'm called to break up fallow ground where it has not been preached. And it's important that as you pursue your purpose and passion, that you not only know what you're called to do, but how you're called to do it. And listen, uh, brothers and sisters, these things, it takes time. It takes walking with the Lord. It takes an unfolding in the journey with him. But all of us should grow to the point where we know that. And so as I was sharing with you, we've learned over the years as God called us to this urban inner city context, he's called us to do this in a, in a way that sacrificially, that has cost us our lives. We've had to let go of many things that we once desired. But I've learned a long time that God is not concerned with my American dream. He's concerned about his plans for his kingdom, his kingdom dreams. If you're going to seek your purpose and passion and you're going to know how God has called you to do it, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost sacrifice. You're going to have to sacrifice something. Paul had to sacrifice much. There was loneliness and isolation and rejection and hardship and incarceration, all these things he had to sacrifice and endure to walk out the call that he had on his life. And the little things that we have had to sacrifice are nothing in the grand scheme of this American life that I live. But there are things we have had to sacrifice. But let me tell you this. Everything that we've had to sacrifice, nothing, Nothing compares to the awesome feeling of having the Lord Jesus and the power of God use you and use us to do work for his kingdom and see it manifest on this earth. I wouldn't trade anything for that. It's what wakes me up every day. It's what makes me go on when I feel like giving up, that I've been able to experience God in this unique and powerful 
an awesome way. And even with all our imperfections and all our screw-ups, and we have messed up some major stuff, I have. There are many things that I have not done well. But I can tell you this, if you live a surrendered life, if you make faithfulness your goal, God has a way of hitting a bullseye even with a crooked stick. He can take our mess ups, he can take our screw ups and still accomplish the task that he has for us. And oh, by the way, what you will find in seeking your purpose and your passion is that as much as God wants to use you, he also wants to change you and work in you. I have found the biggest work that God wanted to do was not what I wanted to do to other people. What he wanted to do through me to other people is what he wanted to do in me and to me. I was the project that he was working on. And so I encourage you this morning, no matter where you are, what stage of life you're in, seek God, be filled with him and be full of his knowledge. Pursue and be active in your local body. And it, this, this, is not for every, this is not just for people who want to pursue full-time ministry. Your passion may be to raise your family in a godly way so that they all become followers of him. That is a passion, and that may be what God called you to do. You may work a full-time job, but God has given you a, a passion and a purpose for something else that you do in your own time. Some of you may be called to full-time ministry. Some of you may never do full-time ministry. This is not about that. This is about why he's created you, why he's purposed you, why he's made you the way he's made you why he's put you in the place that he put you, why you went through everything that you went through so that he ultimately could use you for his greater purpose and his greater plan. So God wants you to have not only purpose, clarity of purpose, but what he's called you to do in your purpose and compassion, but he also wants you to have clarity about how he's called you to do it. In Acts 13, 36, as I close, he says this. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. This is one of my favorite passages because it's the, it's the goal of my life. And I believe it should be the goal of every believer. For David, after he served the purposes of God in his own generation, will God be able to say, will it be said of you when all, all of us one day are going to pass from this earth? The Bible tells us we have 70 to 75 years if due to strength 80. But when it's all said and done, will it be said of you that you served the purposes of God in your generation? Or will they say, will they be able to say, you made all the money you could in your generation? You, you, you bought all the property you could in your generation. You accomplished and, and built up a great name in your generation. Nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. Wow, this is weird. Okay. But will it be said of you? that you serve the purpose of God in your generation. Um. I, want, I want to pray for us this morning that no matter where you are, what you do, that it would be said of you that you were able to serve the purpose of God in your generation. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this time this morning, Lord, and I pray for all those that can hear me no matter where they are in your Lord, I pray that they would find their purpose and passion in you, just like Paul, and that, Father, it would awaken something in them that they would pursue you 
that they would give their lives sacrificially unto you. Father, that they would be used of you and that they would never see glory. We would never see glory for ourselves, but always leave it for you so that folks would come to know you and surrender their hearts to you, Lord. Father, I pray you would do a work in the lives of every person here. Lead us, God. Fill us with you. Fill us with your knowledge. Fill us with the desire to please you so that we may lead others in that way. Father, help us overcome the challenges and the discouragements and, the, and all the things that would seek to call us, to, to, to drive us away from what you called us to do, away from the purpose and passion of our lives. Help us and give us a clarity of focus on you. That the ways of this world would not captivate us. And thus they would not be able to say, we didn't serve the purposes of our generation for you. That it would be said that we were able to do what you called us to do in the season you had given us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, Pastor David Hill, that was uh, outstanding. I got some takeaway from that purpose and, and passion, and you could hear how you're fulfilling your purpose, and you could hear the passion that comes out in your speaking and so forth. And I know that message resonated with many people around the world, regardless of where they find themselves in ministry, regardless of where they find themselves in life. And I think right now, most people are seeking to know what their purpose is. They want to be passionate about something. So, man, I really, really appreciate that. And so uh, those of you who are tying in via Facebook or listening live, uh, this is an indication of some of the things that we have here at Great School of Theology. We're about helping people to find their purpose and about passionately being able to uh, fulfill that, be it in a degree-seeking program or non-degree-seeking program. We are here to serve you. And so uh, in keeping with that, I want to let you guys know about a couple of events that we have upcoming. Uh, next week on September the 17th, from 12 to 1 p.m., we will have what we call a virtual pastor's luncheon. And that name is a misnomer for a number of ways. Uh, we do have a virtual lunch, meaning that it's not where you're going to physically eat. You get a chance to uh, partake of the word. Uh, but what we want to do is we invite pastors and ministry leaders and those who are seeking to dive deeper into the word of God. We, uh, sit down I partake of the word, uh, but what we want to do We give folks an idea of what it is, some of the offerings we have here, primarily from the degree-seeking side at this event uh, here at Grace School of Theology. So we're encouraging you, uh, if you have an interest, an inclination, or a curiosity even, to tie into that event next Thursday uh, from 12 p.m. until 1 p.m. Uh, also, in addition to that, in October, October the 8th, we will have our next chapel service. And you guys, uh, no doubt, you were blown away by what Pastor Hill offered today. But we have another Grace graduate who will come and provide her perspective. And this is going to be uh, Merritt Johnston. And guys, you tie into this, you are in for a treat. Uh, Merritt is very, very uh, eloquent in speaking, has a lot of substance to what she delivers. And I'm not exactly certain how she's going to approach it, but I can tell you this. Each and every one of you will be blessed. And I encourage you to not only come and tie into that chapel service, but invite two or three others to tie in as well. This is a part of our worldwide ministry, what we're doing here at Grace School of Theology. And so I want to provide that information to you, encourage you to take part in it, encourage you to become a part of it encourage you to continue to pursue your passion, your purpose in life, as so eloquently illustrated by Pastor Hill today. Amen? 
And so we will conclude today. I want to do a closing prayer right quick. And uh, let's bow our heads. Eternal God, our Father, we want to thank you today, Lord. We want to thank you for how you have used your servant, Pastor David Hill, to minister to us worldwide, Lord, to speak the truth as it comes from the gospel message, how he has used his life in such a way to illustrate how you are working in the lives of each and every one of us. And so, Father, we want to praise your holy name for just using him in such a, a mighty way. Lord, we pray for blessings on each and every person who is here, each and every person who is listening to this uh, broadcast, each and every person who is seeking you right now, Lord. We're asking that you manifest yourself in a mighty way in their lives, and in a personal way, Lord, such that they know that they are pleasing you. We pray for blessings on this ministry, Lord. We pray for a hedge of protection around each and every one of us, Father. And we pray for success in our endeavor, in our endeavors, Lord, to please you. These things we're asking in your son, Jesus' name. And the whole church says, Amen. Amen. We will see you guys next time.